Hello, I'm Connie Evans, and I was so pleased when Thelma Tracy asked me to talk about my research. I'm the author of three books on wear history, and I get my starting point is always, whoop, there we go, the history of wear. As you can tell, I mean, if you haven't looked at this, it's got a a, a fountain of information in it, believe me. Very interesting little anecdotes and information. Uh, the first book I wrote is about the Pine Tree Riot. And the research I did, of course, you know, I got my, the, the uh, description of what happened and I used it word for word, not, well, not word for word, but I used it um in some cases yeah i used it word for word uh and i think that that's the source that everybody has uh it was taken from the new hampshire gazette and uh widely distributed throughout new hampshire it was a huge event but in doing the research of course i had that but there was so much more you know it's hard to write more than a couple lines without realizing, oh my gosh, I don't know how, what did they wear? What did they eat? What were their homes like? What were the taverns like? There's a chapter where the men wanted to do some trading and bartering and they went to Salem, Mass to do it. And I learned that they, they would go in the winter because they didn't have very good roads. They were basically just Indian trails. And there were taverns every eight miles because they have to refresh themselves and they, you know, they're oxen. They didn't use horses. Oxen were better. And they, they went in the winter because the Pung had, Pung was the, the box like um, wagon in a way with with uh, some runners and that would be easier and the oxen would pull that along any other time they were dealing with uh, terrible rocky roads and not as i said not roads i mean trails and uh mud and you know it was just very difficult so the easiest time for them to go was in the winter who knew? And of course, then when they got to a tavern, what was that like? I had to research what taverns were like in those days. And then what Salem was like, I didn't know. And what was the inn like where they stayed? So all these things, I mean, thank goodness for Google, but um, you know, you pick up little bits of information from articles and diaries. So that and also, what um, what did I want to say? Oh, the characteristics. I mean, that's one thing you do not get from a lot of lot of sources in historical fiction. You've got to make up what they look like and what their personalities were. I had one adjective for uh, John Sherborne, who was the deputy to the king's. Uh, well, he was the, the representative that would come out and look look at all the white pines that had been cut. And if they had the king's broad arrow symbol, the men would be uh, liable and they'd have to pay a fine or go to prison. And he was supposed to be mean, so I could use that. But I didn't know what others were like and to and because there was quite a crew of these men participating in the riot you had to differentiate between them so you had to give them some kind of physical trait or characteristic um so that was kind of interesting to do that's the fun part actually of the research i enjoy the research too but i think it's the fun part of imagining like for instance what what did Ebenezer Mudgett's wife say when he said, I'm not paying the fine 
for cutting down the king's trees, knowing that their lives would be in jeopardy. So how did that conversation go? So I thought that was kind of interesting. The second book I wrote, Tales of Survival in Colonial New England. There are two stories and there was a line I mean, there was a few pages about witches in the um, history of where. And there was one about Rhoda Dustin. Incidentally, her husband was part of the Pine Tree Riot. He took, had a role in that. Um, and <laughs> people really believe some bizarre things. You really get a kick out of some of these stories in here. But they said that... Um, in order, like Reuben Faber was this little boy, and it said that that um, this witch bothered him. What does that mean exactly? I don't know. So the father was very upset, and he wanted wanted this to stop. And his idea was, let's kill her. And this was their method in those days, or they thought it would work. So. Um, to kill the witch, they boiled some of the young man's urine, all agreeing in the meantime to maintain a death-like silence. Someone spoke while the boiling was going on, the spell was broken, and Mrs. Dustin lived. And then it goes on, Reuben's father is not happy with that, and so he, uh, he tries to, he has, they have a confrontation, shall we say. So I thought that was interesting. And, and, and of course, how in the world was she singled out to be a witch? So um, that total fiction. But uh, I used this in, in, the, um, in the story. I mean, it sounds kind of crazy. That, but anyway, it, that, that's what they believed back then. They also believed that she could uh, stand up on a ceiling and you know, with her feet on the ceiling, and her, you know, just like a fly on the wall. Uh, they thought she could fly. They said she did. I think she visited her daughter, and it was 140 miles, and she went on horseback, and it only took her six hours or something. You know, these crazy things. So, so that was interesting to me. And the other thing was, um, I included in here the process for making cloth. Oh my goodness, there's so many steps to that. I knew nothing about it. So they had to grow their flax and they, there were several things they had to do, obviously cut it. And um, let's see, I put down here, they, so they grow it, they pull it, they rot it, they break it, they comb it, they remove the coarse stuff or, or called the tow or tow, tow. Uh, then they have to wind it on the spindle, finally they weave it, and then the material has to be laid out on, on grass or, you know, outside on the ground. And there, there's a, it's a huge process just to make clothing. So I thought that was interesting. And also the time, uh, the, the Reuben Favor, he came from a large family and a very modest family. And they wouldn't eat at a, at a dining room table. They didn't have one. They didn't all sleep in beds. The kids slept in bed rolls. And if there was a bed, it was positioned on the wall and then came down. I know there's a name for that. I forget what it's called. But um, so life was certainly different. And, and so when you're writing a story, you have to take in consideration there's a lot you don't know about daily life. And so you have to research all that. And a lot of that actually was in the history of where. They have, you know, several sections on how, to, how, to, how they made cloth and what they ate, how they cooked. They had a description of, you know, of course they had these big fireplaces and, and they, they had meat on a string. It must have been more than just a string. And, it, you know, somebody's job was to keep twisting this 
so that the meat would, would cook evenly all around. So some little kid had that job of giving it a twist every once in a while. The other story in here uh, is about Timothy Corliss. He was abducted by Indians. And in the history of Ware, it, it said that he was hunting. This was in the 1740s before Ware was a town in our village. And he was abducted by Indians, taken to Canada, and then ransomed. So I knew, I knew where he was hunting, Peacock Brook. I knew th there's a um, description of how the Indians got him in the history of where. And they, you know, marched him all the way to Canada. Well, I had read several stories about Indian abductions. <laughs> Over 1,600 New Englanders were abducted. And many, many, many told the tale. You know, they, there was a, uh, an established village in Deerfield, Mass, where many people were abducted from there. Many were killed, too. But, um, and so there's that. And Mary Rowlandson, I believe, is one of the women from, from that. And she had a, 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 an, an account of all the detailed things that went on when she was abducted. Mary Ingalls, she actually was from Virginia. Um, and then, of course, the Hannah Dustin story and murder on the, no, massacre on the Merrimack provided me. That's a book that provided me with a lot of information. And Mary Neff, who was her um, neighbor, friend, nurse, because Hannah Dustin had just had a baby, um, actually was a, a relative of Timothy Corliss's. Uh, it's interesting how so many of these people were related. But anyway, so I had read, and, and a few other stories I had read, and they all had similar information about how they were treated and, and what, what the march was like. And so, you know, I was able to use that as Timothy's story, because it must have been very similar. Um, and so I, I needed to know a lot about the village, the Indian village in Canada. I needed to know the medicinal herbs they use, what they grew. I needed to know about their um, long houses, what they look like, uh, their hunting, how they, it, there just seemed to be a ton of details that, you know, once you get going and you're writing, like, oh my gosh, yeah, how do they do that? Um, and an interesting thing too was that I contacted a, an Indian organization because I wanted to have authentic Indian names. And so they provided me, for a small donation, they provided me with some, some names. I told them the character, they asked me what are the personalities of these people because apparently these um, children weren't named until they developed a personality or characteristics. So I gave them a description of, of, of the characters and they gave me names that would match. Uh, let's see, what else did I need to know? Herbs and plants, yeah, the hunting. Yep, okay. And the last book, my most recent one is, this, is, this required the most research and this is about the Battle of Bunker Hill that really, well, the Siege of Boston, which includes the Battle of Bunker Hill, which is really the Battle of Breed's Hill. Um, it wasn't really fought on Bunker, but Breed's Hill. And I read a lot of books. I, I read a lot of blogs. I read a lot of articles. I read a lot. I read a speech based on New Hampshire men. And... I found, you know, there, there are times when these noted, notable historians don't quite tell the same picture, which I think is kind of interesting. One of the things that really bothered me was the fact that in many sources, New Hampshire wasn't given its due credit. And our men, and I, and I mentioned this in another presentation, our men 
that's why the title Valor Under Fire. Our men performed heroically under tremendous odds. Now we did not win this battle, but without their courage, um, it, I dare say that the war could have ended right there and we'd be speaking with British accents. Um, they really, and, and, and uh, Nathaniel Philbrick was one of my sources and I, re, I lean heavily on him for the Battle of Chelsea Creek and the final evacuation of the British off of the Boston Peninsula. And I was surprised he just glossed over New Hampshire's uh, involvement. Shame on him. Uh, a blog that I absolutely loved, and I'm telling everybody who, who loves history, is called Boston 1775. And the man that writes that is J.L. Uh, Bell, J.L. Bell. And he, he writes a, a, an entry every day. He's got over 5,000 on his blog spot. And I'm telling you the details. So I, I, I leaned really heavily on a lot of that because there was unique information. I needed to know like how, how, how were all these soldiers fed? We weren't an organized army and men were just coming out of the woods. You know, what happened when they got there? So I needed to know that. I, I needed to know, well, I researched on medicines and disease. Disease was rampant. I, I fired a musket so I could feel what that was like. And uh, I read a book on, on what the soldier, what his, well, not much of a costume really because they just left home in what they wore, but uh, what, what, they, what they carried and in their haversack, what would they have? Um, let's see, I needed to know, um, Oh, how they talked. Um, th that was fun. I found a dictionary, uh, 1796, it was published, and it's called the um, Dictionary of, no, Classical Dictionary of the Vulgar Tongue. And so a lot of expressions, I mean, it wasn't really vulgar. I mean, it just means common. Um, so a lot of the expressions I use, they're very authentic, and we're actually... Um, used then. Oh, I had to understand the musicians, the importance of the musicians and what their drum rolls meant. They had dozens of drum rolls and the soldiers had to learn them so that they knew. I mean, they, they, there was no loudspeaker. They would hear a drum roll and they would know, okay, that means we have to pack up or that means we have to um, get in line, get in formation. I mean, there was a whole bunch of, of different um, roles or sounds. Uh, let's see, what else did I do? Um, uh, re oh yeah, I read several books on John Stark. I mean, he was, he was crucial. So, so that was actually a lot of fun. I, I enjoyed the research, I enjoyed learning and, and coming out of it with such pride for our men. Uh, to me, that was very, very special. And of course, as I did with my others, uh, my other two books, I got a lot of information. My characters were real, were authentic soldiers and where they were positioned in the battle. Um, so yeah, there was a lot of information in the history of where. So I hope I was able to help you or you were interested in the research, and if you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. My, my uh, email is cke1 at comcast.net. So thank you so much for listening. <laughs>